action. Yes. All right, welcome to another episode of uh, Connect and Politic. Uh, we're here with a special guest. So please introduce yourself, tell us your name, where you're currently located, and your favorite snack. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Yolam Anderson Galore. I am currently located in Ottawa, Canada, but spiritually I'm located in the Serengeti. <laughs> and my favorite snack, oh, currently, like during this period of time? Yeah, I mean, it could be now or it could be of all time. Oh, this is a tough one. I'm gravitating towards like anything with hummus. So like pita with hummus, cucumbers with hummus, just Carrot. hummus, yeah. Any um, special brand or type of hummus? I mean, it's just, it doesn't matter? Um, Lebanese are notorious for their hummus. So normally if it was made by the hands of someone from Lebanon, it's probably delicious. <laughs> Do you mean famous or notorious? Notorious. <laughs> notorious. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Good. Hummus. All right. Uh, what's your fondest memory from childhood? Ooh, that's a good one. I think it's a combination. Um, the first time I ever played organized soccer, I was playing goalie. And you know how they split it half the field when you're really young? Mm -hmm. And I was playing goalie. And I scored from my net. I like kicked the ball and it went all the way. And that was like the moment that I knew I was probably gonna be good at soccer. Um, but then like a combination of memories would be probably in California at my grandparents' house in the summer or Christmas time when all the grandchildren would come and we would just play outside in the pool all day. I think those were, those are like the two categories of my fondest memories. Nice, nice. So how do you think your childhood helped you, help groom you into the person you are today? These are good questions, Mike. These are good questions. <laughs> uh, I was very, I was blessed to have grown up in like both my dad's side of the family and my mom's side of the family. Um, both my parents have their PhD. So from like an educational standpoint, that was the most important thing coming from both sides of the family was really that educational piece. And then the other part was anything I wanted to try doing, my parents would enroll me. So I did ballet, I did kickboxing, I did tap dancing, and I got to taste and try all these different things. So I never had really any limitations set on whether it was my education because oh like maybe I should try to get a PhD like my parents that's the standard or um, sports wise or activity wise I could try it all and succeed in like a lot of them so I think just the the ecosystem and the environment they created for me had no limitations and I think it, it speaks volume of the current position situation world that I'm in now um, where I, I just I've never placed barriers for myself, but I just keep going. Nice, nice. Uh, name something in your life that you're not willing to live without. Oh. Live without. I think my family. It'd be weird to live on this planet without them. Um, but if I do like material things, uh, a passport, <laughs> that's what I can't do without. I just need to travel. So my family and a passport and we're good. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, I can imagine the, the current uh, climate is not a, the ideal climate. Um, meaning, you know, you can't really travel anywhere. So. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. What, do you, what are your favorite things to do for self-care? I love randomly walking around with like no destination. Yoga is, I gravitate towards that a lot. 
um, and I ended up like talking to my mom. Like if it was like if the person is my mom, the activity would be a combination of walking or yoga or just going somewhere new. So like when I first came to Canada, I had to quarantine for 21 days and the neighborhood where I got an Airbnb, I could still walk around, but my goal was every time, like I would try to walk to the, to the river that was nearby, but take a different path every single time. It just, it was really cool because then your mind has like a whole new dimension to it. So by the time that my quarantine was over, I knew every single street within a almost like five mile radius. So I'd say walking, yoga, and my mom. Nice. Have you tried combining those three things? So oh, yeah. Doing your, yoga, <laughs> your mom, and then after that, go walk. Yeah, 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 totally. We're on the same wave. So what I would do is I would call my mom. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. I would walk first to the river, get there, do yoga. When I was done, I would call my mom as I'm walking back. That became my daily routine. Nice, nice. That's good. Uh, what do you, uh, what do you, what motivates you? What motivates me? It comes from a pressure, um, a pressure that you, that we've never really, it's never been spoken or put into words. However, being a child of Africa, having grown up in North America um, most of my life and understanding what's going on in Africa, there is this greater responsibility to make sure that everything that I've learned and experienced here, um, I take the good and I go over there and try to share as much knowledge as possible in the I think that's like my drive I think that's my motivation and it does come from this pressure because but then at the same time it's not really pressure it's, it's essentially like your purpose on this planet and I think finding my purpose and understanding that okay I'm I've always been like it's always subconsciously and consciously now like been my intention to go back over there and now it's creating the right situations and paths to make my way there and then knowing how I'm going to do it and what I'm going to do. So I think that's the drive comes from the roots. That was deep, but the drive comes from the roots. What do you do in your professional life and how did you get to where you are? What do I do in my professional life? I am the assistant to the president of Basketball Africa League, who is also the managing director of NBA Africa. So my role is to directly support him. How I got to this position about three, four, three years ago, uh, I finished my master's at U of T and I had this aha moment where I knew that I wanted to start taking um, moving back to Africa, specifically Chad, more seriously. However, I need to find almost like a way, what would I do if I was there? It was like the big question. And it made sense to focus on the sports industry because at that point in time, my entire network was just athletes. Those were my people. And that was essentially the system that I had grown up with. So I, I understood um, both like, youth level, amateur, professional. So I had a good sense of that. So the idea was, okay, that's my way into the continent, specifically in Chad. And so this is three years ago. And then I had to narrow it down even more to pick a sport. So Chadians were a very tall population. Our ancestors are like seven, eight feet tall. So, so when you go to Chad, you have all these giants just – walking around playing soccer <laughs> it doesn't make sense <laughs> they're perfect for basketball and so it was one of those like oh no brainers let's start developing basketball there's so much nba potential just walking around they don't even know what basketball is and so 
that was, that became my focus and what I was going to dedicate my time to. And I knew that I needed to collaborate some way, somehow with the NBA um, because the NBA was doing such a great job at that point in time on the continent. And at the core, they're very ethical organization. And I knew that um, everything that they do on the continent, it's done the right way. And so that started kind of my search. I bought a ticket to go to Tunisia for Afrobasket. This is 2017. And then as soon as I landed in that country, a million opportunities opened up. I met um, with all the people from NBA Africa. It started a relationship with them. And I started going to, I went to South Africa to experience junior NBA. I end up be doing PR for both the Congolese national team and the Chadian national team. Went to the FIBA world qualifiers with Chad. And it's just like, and all of this is in the span of three months. <laughs> so, and then after that, there's an opportunity with the Toronto Raptors where they pick one Canadian every year and they're called the Wayne Embry Fellow. And for people who don't know who Wayne Embry is, shout out. Um, he's the first black general manager of any professional sports organization in North America. And he's currently the senior advisor for the Raptors. So they named the fellowship after him with the goal of putting more Canadians in front office positions within the NBA, um, because there's just, there's not that many, although we have a team in Canada. And so I applied, I won, I spent um, my Wayne Embry Fellowship with the Toronto Raptors during their championship season. And that same year is when they announced the Basketball Africa League that the NBA was going to start. And then it just, it made sense. You had this um, collection of if you don't know the Raptors, there's a lot of Africans on the team. The president is from Nigeria. You have a Congolese coach in the mix. You have a South African scout. Um, so there's there's a core that's there. And they became, they, I don't know how to explain it, but I do know how to explain it. They were kind of like that circle of elders for me within the organization. All of them realize and I appreciate it so much now but they had this greater responsibility to my development so every single person within that circle and there's so many others within the organization as well really took the time to help me grow and understand the industry and then when BAL came about um, and the folks at the BAL were they were aware of what I had been doing it was kind of like this circle of elders passing me off to the BAL and essentially being like, she's ready, you need to take her. And then it was just this organic experience and then it led me to this position that I'm in now. That was also the, the season that you, you guys won. The yeah. So it was, was kind of cool. Like I, I, I won a championship my first year in the <laughs> league. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, uh, what's one thing that you would love to learn that you haven't gotten to yet? Uh, there's two things. The first thing is coding. I really want to learn how to code and just create my own reality, although I'm already doing it. <laughs> and then um, the other thing that I want to, I want to pick up again is the piano. I know the basics, like obviously my parents put me in piano lessons. So I know the basics, but I do want to give it a little bit more attention. Coding and piano. Cool. Um, can you think of any advice that you would give your younger self? Mm, this is a good one. Um, not care so much about people's opinions. I think if I was looking at my younger self right now, I'd have her develop a mechanism to block out noise and sound and like just listen to self. But then at the same time, I think you have to experience like certain things in life to get to that point. Um, but if I had to speak to my younger self and younger women, it's just 
you need to block out the noise that just doesn't make sense. Because I, I, I believe there's probably points in my life where those noises influence my behavior without a doubt, without a doubt. So I would say, yeah, just block out the noise and do you, boo boo, do you. Nice. Uh, on that same topic, throughout your years, what's the best advice you've received? Oh, I don't know. So much. Um, one car, I think one of them, back to like limitations and stuff, it was a former NBA player. And I had asked him, like, what advice would you give to your younger self? And he said, don't ever let anybody else set your limitations. I think that's key. That's probably the one that has stuck. Um, and then the other one I read in a book, but it, it's just whatever you do, you have to make sure that you're serving, that you're serving a greater purpose. I think just in life, everything you do, you just have to make sure that you're serving because then what are you really doing? Nice. What has been the toughest thing you've had to tackle and what helped you get through it? toughest thing I've had to tackle a lot Mike a lot um I don't know can we loop back to that question I gotta think about that one <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll, we'll, we'll loop back we'll, we'll loop back uh, it, it might we'll loop back anyway uh what makes you happy uh, vitamin D, the sun, <laughs> warm weather, <laughs> tropical weather. Um, no, I think the where I get like pure joy, and this is such a social worky thing too, is um, especially when with youth, when you build that connection with them, and then they start taking steps towards you, like that moment in time in any relationship where now that person's coming to you and because you've built that trust that's i think that gives me like pure joy um something that i like i did right but then also like just someone entrusting me um it's something that i don't know it's, it's like they've almost become like vulnerable and to like share vulnerability with another that's a really like it's a very genuine connection so i think that that brings me a lot of joy. If you won the lottery tomorrow, what would you do? I would call my wealth manager. <laughs> I'd probably, honestly, like, I don't know. This is a good question. Is it something I don't really need to do to wait to win the lottery? But I would just start like constructing my reality. What does my house look like in Dakar? What does my house look like in Chad? Where else do I want a house? How am I gonna continue making this money grow? Like, do I still wanna do the job that I'm doing, although I'm a millionaire? I think it'd be just a lot of meditation and painting my world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you meant actual painting. I thought you Probably. <laughs> Um, so if you knew you had 24 hours to live, right, what are the things that you wish you would have done? Uh, step foot in every continent. That was my goal by the time I was 30. I'm 30 now and I haven't. It would be, yeah, I don't know if I can do it in 24 hours, um, but it would be step foot in every continent is what I've always wanted to do. And I've always wanted to go to India. I think since um, getting really into yoga practice, there is this desire to go there um, mm -hmm. from both just like the practice, but also like a spiritual level. I would just, this is a lot. And I'd like, I want to open a school in Chad, but I don't know if I can do that in 24 hours. I don't know, but I think see all, all different countries and then end in shot <laughs> <laughs> right but okay so is, is that is that what would you do in 24 hours it's 
you know you ha- you only have 24 hours to live, right? Okay, I only have 24 hours left. Yeah, and so then you're thinking, like, what are all the things I wish I had done in my life now that it's coming to an end? Okay, so if I was, if I had won the lottery, so I'm now a millionaire and I have 24 hours left, sure. what I would do is everything that I ever wanted to do, I would list it out and in my will, I will give, I will assign people this responsibility to actually do it on my behalf and I will pay you to do it. That's what I would do. And I would use those 24 hours to plot that out and assign tasks to people. Nice, nice. All right. Are you ready to go back to what's the toughest thing you had to tackle? It will help you get through it. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think I'm ready for this. All right. The toughest thing I've had to tackle is overcoming like a box being enclosed in me. I think any, and I think it happens to everyone professionally if you end up in like any industry, like you can easily be labeled as this is what she does. So trying to get out of that box and like stay out of that box, it's a ongoing challenge, but I'm pretty sure I've like broken free and now I'm in a position where people just ask me to do whatever and I love it. Um, there's that, but I honestly, I think that the toughest, toughest thing is uh, leaving a situation where, let me run. I think everyone desires to be loved, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in a company, um, there's always a desire that you hope the other part loves you too. And recently, I think I, and I think I'm still like processing it, but I'm a lot, I feel a lot lighter, but I had to just pull myself from an environment where I wasn't loved although I was still trying, trying so hard to be loved and I had to really pull myself back. And that's, it's a difficult process because in it, you, you question yourself, you wonder why, like the other folks didn't like you. Um, and then it can like crush your ego. <laughs> like it, just, it makes you feel so small and so unwanted and then so i think that was that's like been uh, it's been a almost like a one plus two year process and it's hard but i think i'm like getting there day by day i i have this greater appreciation for like who i am who i've become who i've what i've achieved um where i'm going that that little i don't know organism becomes smaller and smaller and is even more distant from like my reality and that's that's a process and it's hard but like once you can get there it's oh my gosh like you're a bird you're free so <laughs> that's like the hardest thing <laughs> okay and what what uh what tools tactics or strategies are you using to get there Uh, the first thing is really, it's mind control. I think you you get into just this rhythm of thinking too much about it and your mind can go very negative and it's, it's knowing when to switch it off. That's a practice. And so sometimes, and it was, it's great. I, I did this one meditation with this lady, it was 30 minutes and it was just seated meditation. And at one point it was quiet in the room And all you hear is, stop thinking. And it was her. And it was, and now it resonates in my head. Like sometimes I have to shush myself and then you move on and you, you think of, you look at these thoughts as clouds and just let the cloud pass and don't, don't overthink it. So I think that's step one is you have to shift your brain to not think about that. The other part is you you always have to be very um, grateful and, have a lot of gratitude because yes, maybe I wasn't loved in these experiences. However, 
I had a great time if we're looking at the good stuff. <laughs> like, I had no regrets. Like, it got me to where I'm at. Every single thing I've done in my life has gotten me to this present moment. So I have to be grateful for that. And then the other part is just you, you just have to become love. I think moving forward and as I climb in whatever positions, whatever relationships, um, I never want someone else to feel the way I felt. So I have to make that effort to just spread love and be love in anything that I do, whether it's professionally, whether it's romantically, whether it's a friendship. Um, I think that would be like the three things. It's like your mind, gratitude and, and love helps you to, to just move on. That's good. And for the final question, how do you define success? Like, kudos. These questions today have been great. <laughs> how do you define success? Uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you've created a work plan and you've completed that work plan, that is success. If you've set a goal for yourself and you've reached it, that's success. If you uh, are in a championship game and you win, that's success. I think to me, success is winning in whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's like, this sounds like so competitive. Success is all about winning. <laughs> you just gotta win. Win in life, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Wait, all right. that's a good way to end it all right well we connected we politic and we'll definitely do this again in the near future thanks. this was great thanks for having me great questions <laughs>